Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Ian Ayers, the William K. Townsend Professor at Yale Law School and a professor at Yale School of Management. He's also the author of Super Crunchers, Why Thinking by Numbers is the New Way to be Smart. Stay tuned at the end of this podcast for a postscript where I expand on some of the issues raised by today's conversation. Ian, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, it's great to be here. Your book's about the triumph of facts over intuition. You argue we can make better decisions as individuals, as business executives, and as a society if we pay attention to the facts, particularly facts or findings that come out of statistical analysis. I want to confess from the start that I had a little bit of a schizophrenic reaction to the book. I'm a big fan of facts and statistics, but the devil is in the details, particularly when it comes to, t- to statistical analysis and even plain statistics. So I want to start with with um, letting you make the case for super crunching, the use of numbers and the use of, of data and, and analysis. Tell us about the Orly Ashenfelter story and uh, Bill James and what they tell us. Sure. Well, or- Orly Ashenfelter is one of the great uh, statistical economists in the world, and uh, he also has a passion for wine. And uh, he's combined the two uh, by going out and uh, doing the statistical analysis of the quality of Bordeaux's. Uh, he has collected historical information on the uh, growing temperature and the rainfall at, in the Bordeaux regions of France, and he has uh, done a, a statistical analysis, a technique called a multivariate regression, uh, to try to uh, find underlying correlations, underlying causal influences between the growing conditions, the rainfall and the weather, and the quality of the wine. And um, he's been uh, surprisingly accurate, and this strikes, this really gets in the craw of some people and are surprising. Why, why would you need to do this? You should be able to just go out and drink the wine and figure out how good it'll be. Uh, but it turns out that with Bordeaux, you, you can't drink them for several months, and even the first tasting is pretty uh, unpalatable. Uh, and and pretty imprecise. Uh, it's hard to figure out from this early muck what it's going to ultimately taste like. And and so one of the things that's uh, happened is that uh, Ashenfelter has gone up against Robert Parker, one of the great uh, traditional uh, wine tasters. And Ashenfelter, over uh, the last uh, uh, decade, has been doing a better job. And even Parker, while he's been dismissive of Ashenfelter, um, has more and more been incorporating the weather conditions into his own uh, predictions of, of wine quality. And it's a classic example which repeats itself in the Bill James story of where an expert who's relied on intuition and sort of this mystical feel or gut feeling or sixth sense is outperformed by a rather crude statistical analysis in the case that's, of Eschenfelter. That's right. You wouldn't think there was much of a connection between uh, the rarefied uh, world of wine tasting and uh, that of uh, scouting um, uh, baseball talent. But in both, ty- in both cases, you have people that are trying to, traditional experts use their senses, their taste, or their eyes uh, to judge uh, an immature product. And in both cases, uh, statistical analysis is done uh, better. Um, and, and you see this uh, trend of the, fi- there's almost an iron law of resistance that uh, the traditional experts don't like yielding uh, their uh, status, their discretion to this new breed of number cruncher. Well, in the case of baseball and wine, um, it's really – there's nothing tragic about the fact that a player who walks a lot and that goes unnoticed by the scouts doesn't get drafted uh, or a, a Bordeaux that's going to actually turn out to be fantastic is underestimated by the experts. That's just a shame, those, those, those two events. But you do mention an example in the book, which I'm, I've always been interested in, which is the example of Semmelweis. Semmelweis was the doctor who realized that women were dying in childbirth because doctors came from the morgue and then went and delivered babies without washing their hands. 
And there, the failure to use uh, crude statistics was uh, fatal to thousands of women and was resisted by the medical profession, as you mentioned. Exactly right. And this resistance, uh, it is still continuing a bit even today. Uh, Part of it is uh, a resistance uh, to numbers, but part of it is a resistance of physicians who just don't like outsiders telling them that they have to change what they do. Uh, And even today... Uh, physicians aren't cleaning their hands enough. They they scrub meticulously uh, before they go into the operating room, but still there's a tendency to uh, breathe from one patient to the next without washing your hands. And routinized clean hand projects that uh, force physicians to wash their hand every time they go by a certain spot has been shown to uh, uh, to save lives. In the case of Semmelweis, uh, there's a nice bio of him, which I, which I recommend to, to our listeners. I, I'll put the name of it up on the web, uh, on our website. But there's, in that bio, the, uh, the tr- one of the tragedies of Semmelweis is he was very arrogant and very confident and did a very quick statistical analysis that confirmed his hypothesis. And he didn't spend a lot of time marketing the, the, um, the findings to the doctors, and they dismissed it for a whole bunch of reasons, <clears throat> ego, uh, a dislike of his personality, uh, all kinds of reasons that, again, were they really made a difference. And the world, uh, statistics, when presented correctly, can be a devastating critique. I think in the case of the wine example that you give and the case of, of the use of statistics in baseball, there's just a growing recognition that, that the so-called experts in the past have missed something. And with Simmel, I just got to love somebody named Ignatz. Yeah, no, he's, he's underappreciated, I think, just for that reason alone. Um, you give the example of how businesses are using uh, data in creative ways uh, to do a better job, sometimes of serving customers, sometimes just making money. Uh, I'm very interested in the Walmart story. Uh, I, I've heard that story before about what Walmart does when a hurricane's coming. Is that a true? Tell what that's tell that story and tell me if it's true. Well, it's it, uh, from published reports, it seems to be that Walmart has done a very good job of uh, data mining uh, past consumer responses to uh, hurricanes. And one of the things that uh, has been uh, published in, in several other uh, uh, newspaper articles, in which I also uh, uh, mention, is that they have found, uh, by trolling through their data, that... Uh, that uh, after a hurricane, people tend to like um, uh, pop tarts, and that you don't need to uh, uh, they that you don't need to refrigerate them, and uh, that the, the gooey comfort of uh, pop tarts is in high demand. And so Walmart has uh, taken to uh, uh, when they where they watch the weather reports, and when a hurricane is uh, predicted to come in, they will start pumping up the Pop-Tart uh, inventory uh, even before the hurricane uh, hits. So, I've, re- I've read those stories, too, I, and I love the story. I mean, it's a great story, and I think, I think the essence of it's true, but I'd like to hear from someone anonymously at Walmart or, uh, or on the record or even a listener who, in the advance of a hurricane, has, has bought a lot of Pop-Tarts either before or after it. Uh, yeah, well, it, it just crossed my mind that it might have been Walmart um, pulling somebody's leg. It, it could be, <laughs> and you know, and there, there's other, there's a story that I don't mention, which uh, had the aura of even more, uh, uh, even more to me of, of an urban myth is the number crunching that said that putting uh, beer and diapers together uh, increases sales because you ha- uh, in in uh, quick marts <laughs> because. Uh, uh, fathers come in stressed out for stressed out for diapers and grab beers uh, along the way. I don't think they come in for beer and grab diapers, but but anyway, that seems like a stretch. But it's it, a, but the idea of it's probably in, in the ballpark. And what I can say is there have been um, uh, uh, very well controlled uh, randomized uh, tests of planograms, the way that uh, grocery stores are uh, laid out and. Uh, what I, I what I'm, uh, I am more confident of is that there are cool results. That it, it turns out that if you uh, take uh, uh, switch the traditional placement of toothpaste and toothbrushes, uh, most people come and you buy a lot more toothpaste than toothbrushes. Uh, but it turns out toothbrushes are a uh, 
um, are a higher markup item, and you if if you put those more at chest high uh, level in the prime viewing area of customers, you it's uh, it spar- it sparks uh, more purchases. So that's a um, there is lots of of. Uh, randomized testing that is starting to happen with regard to planograms and what products you put on the end of the aisle and uh, whether you, uh, what kind of promotions you give uh, to try to start figuring out what is the impact of moving products around. We did a, a earlier podcast with David Weinberger on, on some of the issues related to store placement and, and customer convenience. Uh, that, that listeners might enjoy. Talk a little bit more about randomized experiments, though. You give a, you talk about how, what Capital One has been doing, and I found that interesting in and of itself, but it also answered a question that's bothered me for a while, which is why sometimes when you call, say, a credit card company or someone else, they ask for your account number or they ask you for your, your flight number, and then they ask, the, the, the recording asks you that, and then when you get through to the actual person, they ask you again. And you suggest one reason why that might be true. You don't mention that explicitly, but you give you you provide a story that helps me understand that I think, which is that what that recording is doing is not telling the um, agent your um, account number, but actually routing different customers to different uh, either other recorded calls or an actual agent. Tell us tell us what they're doing. Sure. Well, uh, Capital One is one of the great heroes of. of- Super crunching. They uh, both uh, they use both techniques that the book is centrally about. Both uh, the crunching of historical data and uh, the use of randomized tests. And on the on the historical front, they uh, have uh, they uh, will correlate um, uh, customers' attributes to try to figure out uh, what kind of products and services you want. And so before you even um, before you even um, uh, uh, an operator picks up your call uh, the, before the operator's eyes. The screen flashes uh, the predicted uh, products that and services that you're likely to be most interested in, and it's been a, a huge uh, gain to Cap One with regard to upselling. Now, uh, and let me say clearly, I'm not a great fan of being uh, of upselling when the uh, when I'm at the movie theater and they ask you, you know, would you want to have a, an extra bag of popcorn with that? But if, if people are going to upsell me, I'd much prefer for them to upsell me on products that I'm actually interested in sure. rather than things that I don't like. And, and so this, is, this is, uh, uh, has been proven to be very effective. Uh, they'll even, if you are going in to uh, renegotiate your uh, interest rate, if you say you have a uh, competing offer, they don't give discretion to their individual um, uh, employees. The computer screen calculates what's uh, the counter interest rate that they should offer you, and, then, and that's very effective. But what really sets Cap One apart uh, is that they also just do tons of randomized experiments. Uh, they send out hundreds of thousands of uh, mail, uh, mailings uh, soliciting business, and that is a, just a beautiful um, opportunity that they have capitalized on to uh, test what kinds of promotions work best. And they, they play with their content, and they might send 100,000 um, uh, hundred thousand mailings to uh, uh, one group of, of prospects with a picture of a kitten on it and uh, another 100,000 that are identical except they have a, uh, a picture of a puppy on it. And you can just see, well, which one uh, has the uh, bigger impact of translating into uh, new accounts. Or they can test, is it better to have a 2% teaser rate for uh, four months or a 1% uh, t- teaser rate for two months? Which has has a bigger impact of encouraging people to start up accounts, and and again, uh, just by they send out so many mailings that they can easily um, uh, randomly assign people to one of the two groups with these large numbers. Something called the law of, of large numbers is going to pretty much assure that the two groups of um, applicants or of prospects are identical on every dimension except for the fact that the one dimension that that cap one controls what promotion they're exposed to yeah yeah 
they're not literally identical. E- each person who receives it isn't identical, but the two groups on average differ only by the, the picture set. And, 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 and indeed, it's a little bit even stronger than that. It's not just that the two groups on average are the same, but the distributions of the two groups yeah, will be the same. If you graph, for example, the height of the two groups, uh, the bell curves are going to look just about identical to each other. Because uh, you have enough people that you're not going to be getting just uh, the, um, say, Boston Celtics to getting the mailing and, and exactly getting something right. affecting and, the, the likelihood of them being attracted by the interest rate that differs because it's associated with height or whatever the other variable is. And I'm, to be honest, I'm pretty obsessed just with randomization, uh, particularly uh, for business, that they're at the end of the day, a lot of regression analysis, and let me tell you, I've done tons of regression analysis in my own work, but at the end of the day, there's a bit of trust me uh, statistics about it. That the, a, lot, uh, if, uh, a lot of readers who are not statistically sophisticated, they just have to trust that you controlled for the right things, that you did it right. But there's such a power in the simplicity uh, that, that um, randomized studies produce such transparent results that you don't have to trust the statistician as much. Uh, it's just so powerful when you do a study and you find out, oh, actually having uh, a 4% uh, teaser for six months uh, did a lot better than all the other randomly assigned groups. And since those other randomly assigned groups, they statistically should have been similar to each other, it must be that this promotion is what's driving it. And that's uh, that tells you something about cause that is, you know, the holy grail of statistics. And let's move on again to an application where it's a little uh, more important, which is uh, what's called EBM that you discuss in the book, uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, we like to think that medicine's kind of scientific, not kind of. We th- like to think it's very scientific. And yet, as you point out, a lot of practices of doctors are rooted in habits, many of which are good, obviously, but some of which are uh, not reliable and can be approved on by using data, and particularly data generated by random trials. Give us some examples of that. Well, there, there are, are tons of them uh, where they've gone out and done uh, studies on uh, whether uh, taping your knee uh, actually gives relief uh, to, uh, to knee pain or uh, whether uh, uh, you need to take uh, oral vitamins or vitamin shots, uh, whether those are equally effective at, at curing uh, anemia. And uh, uh, there have been randomized studies on whether certain types of acupuncture work or not. And the, the big changes that have, uh, to me, that have grown out of this uh, evidence-based medicine movement is one, there is now a uh, systematic grading of the quality of evidence uh, behind just about every treatment or potential treatment that is out there. And sometimes you still need to treat diseases. Sometimes there's just no good statistical evidence behind it, and they'll give it a low grade based on just the consensus of experts. Other times there will be uh, one or a few uh, historical cross-sectional studies, uh, but sometimes it goes up to the highest grades or when there are multiple randomized, well-controlled studies that point in the same direction. And this grading of evidence, it, it creates a kind of competition. It's easy for researchers to see where the holes in the data are, and they can go out and they can start doing studies to start gradually increasing the quality of evidence behind all the, all the treatments. Uh, the second big change, which is, hasn't really been remarked on much, is that physicians are, for the first time uh, in recent years, have started to do patient-specific research. And um, in the old days, like 1990, very few physicians would ever go out and look up information for specific patients. They might read generally in the field, but this is... I mean, another way to say this, if you think back to uh, your physician's office in 1990, there was no uh, medical library, and they didn't need one because they never were going to use it anyway. Correct. And so now... Too time intensive. They couldn't wander over to the library and start leafing through... And they wouldn't know how to read it anyway because back then most of them didn't know statistics. But now the Internet has arrived, so every physician has a massive library through the Internet available 
These treatments have grades attached to them, so they don't even, the physicians that don't know statistics, in a sense, don't need to know all the statistics. They at least can rely, oh, this treatment has a grade of A behind it, this other one has C+, and you can have a sense of uh, whether you can let your discretion have more uh, free play when there's less statistical evidence uh, going against it. Yeah, it seems like it's an incredibly important uh, phenomenon. It's going to get increasingly uh, useful for doctors. You give the example of just Googling symptoms to find a diagnosis that you might have missed. One of the things I worry about, uh, a doctor wrote me that in his hospital, he's they're mandated that when a patient comes in with pneumonia, they have to have antibiotics within four hours, and they try to make sure that that everybody with pneumonia gets antibiotics within four hours, which is a good thing. Obviously, if you have pneumonia, you can die. And it's, it's again, not a, not a small matter. It's a big matter. And so requiring, if we find that within four hours, you're much more likely to live based on, on randomized trials of people who've got it within and without, within four hours and outside of four hours, you, you want to make sure you get the treatment within four hours. However, what he says has happened at his hospital is that because of that mandate, Every patient who comes in who might have pneumonia gets a chest X-ray to make sure they don't miss anybody, which is good. That way, you don't miss anybody. You're less likely to miss someone. But people come in with colds, get a chest X-ray, and as a result, it's very, very expensive. So that's one of the pitfalls of this kind of rules versus uh, data versus you know gut instinct, where you get a lot of benefits, but there are sometimes these kind of hidden costs. Yeah, and I, and I would say it's not so. This is not an example of data versus discretion, but it's, uh, it's whether the data gives rise to the right rules or not. And, uh, and I'm not sure it's a, I'm agnostic about whether giving everybody a chest x-ray is good or not. Correct. I'd rather, let's let the, num- let's, uh, uh, let's let the numbers tell us. And um, uh, basically, with regard to physicians, they have uh, just about ceded their control over treatment, um, uh, once a uh, once a disease is diagnosed, the evidence-based medicine kicks in and has really taken away most of the physician uh, discretion at that point. But physicians still, at the moment, have uh, front-end discretion on how they uh, on how they go about diagnosing, including how they go about uh, what tests to run in order to help make the diagnosis. And the the next. Um, EBM revolution that we're just in the midst of, of beginning is physicians, I predict, are going to lose their front-end discretion. We're going to start for the first time having uh, digital medical records that will give us answers to question, well, what class of people should get those x-rays and, and, and what class shouldn't? When is the, uh, when is the medical benefit worth, worth the cost? Yeah, I, I worry a little bit about that. Obviously, uh... We, we like the idea of trusting our doctor uh, when the doctor is trustworthy. So one of the one of the implications of this revolution is that your doctor hasn't been as trustworthy as you'd like. But one of the problems, of course, is that the incentives the doctor faces in today's highly regulated and highly litigious medical world is that doctors' decisions to order a test are not always the same as your um, desires. And it's interesting how that EBM will interface with that. That's right. And it may be that, uh, uh, that the insurance companies will, uh, with an eye on the bottom line, will direct them toward too little tests or that lawyers with an eye on uh, Their bottom potential line. liability <laughs> will be too much test. Yeah. But, the, but the big thing is we're just so non-data driven with regard to this, these front-end decisions uh, of, of whether to um, it's been so non-routinized, and, and I have a, uh, my, my view is that if you're running any institution with uh, a thousand uh, frontline employees, that um, look, I, I, here's a theorem for you: about half of them are going to be below average, all right. Mm-hmm. And for you to build your institution uh, for those that are the top ten percent is crazy. That uh, over half of them are going to be below average and routinized standard. This is just, I'm, I'm back with Ignat, Similize, you know, that you um, actually taking away some of their discretion is likely to uh, pay off. Now, how much is some, all of their discretion, no, but there's still way too much. Uh, or to put this another way, uh, kind of provocatively, uh, most of our relatives from a statistical standpoint have died in vain because 
all the information from their hospitalizations have just been thrown away to the rest of humanity. And for the first time, this is just changing, right? you know, this year, next year, where suddenly all the hospitalization records are going to have a chance to help save lives uh, instead of being thrown away. Yeah, uh, I, I, I certainly agree with that, even in that provocative uh, wording. I, we have a lot to learn, and, and benchmarking and, and the application of data to these problems is, is going to make a huge difference, I believe, as long as the incentives are there to use it. Um, and that's a great point, too. Um, before we shift gears, I want to move on to a, to a different topic. I, I want to give you a chance to mention your prediction page at supercrunchers.com and what, what readers will find, listeners will find there. Sure. I've, I've uh, gathered together and created um, some of my own, about 40 prediction tools that uh, can let anybody get into the game of uh, super crunching. So uh, I've uh, taken the results of uh, tons of different regressions, and you can go and just by plugging in some information about you, uh, yourself, or a loved one, you can uh, predict uh, the, uh, how long you'll live or uh, if you're pregnant, when your due date is. Uh, it will help you predict sporting events or presidential elections, um, uh, how long your marriage will last, uh, how tall your kids will be, just uh, all across whether if you have a book title that you're interested in, you have a book you want to write, you can plug in a, a book title. It'll tell you the likelihood that that uh, title uh, might become a, a bestseller. So, well, you, again, that's at supercrunchers.com. Yep. But, you know, you say it'll predict. It will give you the average the, the average length of marriage of people with your characteristics. It, of course, will not predict accurately to the day unless it's with only with a small probability. Exactly right. And, and, but, you know, one of the beautiful things about uh, these uh, predictions, and uh, some of them that I've created actually have this second characteristic right up on the face so you can see it, is that the regression output not only makes a prediction for you, but it will simultaneously tell you the precision of that prediction. And so if the, uh, if the data is not uh, very... Uh, high quality, or if the underlying result is itself somewhat random, the uh, prediction, the regression will tell you. The statistical output would tell you that this isn't a very precise uh, prediction. With so, for example, when if you go and use the uh, due date uh, prediction tool that I uh, that I made uh, based on a, a journal article, uh, it not only tells you your uh, the average due date for a person like you but it will give you a 95% uh, confidence range. So 95% of the time, you will deliver between this date and this date. That's very cool. Uh, I look forward to checking that out myself. Um, but let's shift gears, and let's turn... So what we've talked about so far are some of the ways that using data rather than intuition can make your life better or make your company perform better or make your hospital safer, et cetera, more effective. And those are all glorious things. But we're both economists, and in the area of economics, these regression analyses, these uses of statistical analysis to try to hold a bunch of stuff constant and look at the effect of one variable, I would argue is, is highly problematic, despite the fact that we teach our students all the time about how to do it. And I, I want to get on my soapbox for a minute and, and get your uh, reaction. I, I would argue that you talk in the book about uncovering the secret levers of causation, and you call it. Uh, and I don't think we're very good at that. I know there are a lot of published articles about it, but I think the complexity of economic life makes it extremely difficult to isolate uh, the effect of one variable on another with, with confidence. Even the facts are elusive. I want to start with an example of what's happened to the standard of living in America since, since the late 1970s. That's highly difficult, incredibly difficult to know. A lot of people believe that our standard of living has been stagnant since, 19, since the late 70s, and they point to a fact. They point to average hourly earnings uh, corrected for inflation, and they are actually lower uh, in the published government data than they, are, um, than they were in the late 1970s. And yet, the measurement of inflation is problematic. It doesn't include fringe benefits. It doesn't include population demographic changes that would, through composition effects, alter that. So I would argue even that inc seemingly incredibly simple piece of data that we, we think would be so well established by economics is highly controversial. 
Uh, I agree. Uh, I, to me, though, it's not the standard of living is not so uh, easy to measure. Uh, uh, happiness is not uh, easy to measure, and and so if you don't have an outcome variable that you trust uh, and that you really care about, uh, and indeed even if you have them that you trust and care about, if there's more than one, it's sometimes hard to figure out the how how much you care about the relative one. So. Uh, measurement difficulties can really limit the places where uh, statistical analysis uh, can be done. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm of the view that uh, super crunching or statistical analysis more generally cannot answer, uh, uh, make accurate predictions about all things. There are going to be a lot of important limitations. You can't measure the things you care about. Uh, you don't have um, adequate um, size data set on historical uh, uh, of historical comparable examples you don't uh, you can't run a randomized experiment on uh, whether you're going to do a moonshot or not uh, so i'm I'm with you that uh, you can't uh, predict everything and in particular the the randomized part of it uh, in, in the case of a controlled experiment even a controlled experiment can be difficult because you may not have the right a large enough population the, the examples you gave earlier Hundreds, say, a hundred thousand people receiving a letter. That's a pretty good sample size. And a lot of medical experiments that aren't uh, uh, the degree of of precision is very small. Uh, in fact, a, lo- a lot of people are claiming that maybe as many as half of all statistical results published in in the scientific literature are wrong. How do you react to that claim? Well, uh, it's depressing, isn't it? The only it? way we're going to <laughs> know the answer, uh, believe that uh, claim, is through other statistics. And uh, we're not going to believe it through uh, experts. And the, the big claim that of this book is not that uh, statistical prediction is invariably accurate or that it is precise. The claim is a relative one that in case after case, statistical cr- prediction does better than human prediction. And that uh, and one of the things that people really get wrong is they think that the more subtle and uh, difficult the prediction, the more we should rely on humans. But actually, when the the greater, when you have more than ten underlying causal variables, that's actually when the humans do relatively poorly uh, compared to. Uh, statistical prediction, even crude statistical prediction, when it's a subtle uh, event, tends to do better uh, than humans. And it's because humans just can't bring themselves to put the right weights on the big variables. Uh, I'd say it's not 10, it's probably three. Uh, well, and that's right. Three might things, be three. People have trouble. If it's something out the like, uh, uh, if the one factor thing, humans are just great. You know, if you shake a Coke can, what happens when you open it? You know, that's a one factor deal. We're great on that. It's going to fizz out on you. Uh, but when it's and, and one of the great examples of this to me is from my own field of law. They did this experiment on trying to predict the uh, the votes of Supreme Court justices for every case in 2002. And uh, you're just trying on, in one corner. They had 83 legal experts who were trying to predict for each of the nine justices whether it would be a vote to affirm or reverse. And in the other corner, they had a incredibly crude um, uh, statistical um, algorithm that didn't take account of the uh, explicit issue that was involved in the case. I mean, instead, this was, is the government a party? Uh, what uh, part of the country did it come out? Was the uh, lower uh, court opinion coded by a human to be liberal or conservative? Those were the kind of crude factors. And lo and behold, once again, as in dozens of other studies, the statistical algorithm did better than the legal experts. And many of these legal experts, I mean, they had clerked on the Supreme Court. They, they should be killing this, this crude thing. And, but the reason why is that the legal experts just can't bring themselves to pay attention to uh, the things that they already know. So everybody in the, in the law business knows that the Supreme Court hates California. They just hate the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It's largely in California. Uh, the legal experts know this, but they can't bring themselves to put a big enough weight on cases out of the Ninth Circuit are likely to be reversed. And so even a crude st- 
statistical. When you get complicated, humans tend to think, oh, that's when we have to defer to the gray-haired physician. That's when we need to bring in the person that's had 20 years of experience uh, doing this kind of design or that knows what the uh, Supreme Court justice has had for breakfast. But surprise, this is where we really get it wrong. It's not that the, let me tell you, this statistical algorithm wasn't really precise, but it did better than humans. That's, yeah, that's the big fascinating. surprise. It's fascinating, and I, again, I don't disagree with that. I think when there's a reasonable presumption that random uh, factors are separating your two uh, po- your populations, or when there's uh, no second, uh, causation isn't running in the opposite direction, when there aren't too many things going on at once, yeah, I think numbers do really well. But let's take some social issues that you've written on and that are that are highly contentious. Um, what's the effect of immigration on wages of native-born Americans? What's the effect of Walmart on an area? Is it good or bad? Um, you write in the book about uh, LoJack, which is an example, really interesting phenomenon where where automobiles that are equipped with a radio chip that allows a car to be tracked after it's stolen. And you find that it has a huge impact, not just on the person itself getting getting the car back, the, the victim, but on reducing the rate of, of crime, car theft in the area. You also talk about concealed handgun laws, and which seem very similar to LoJack. And yet you argue, and others have argued, that the work that shows by John Lott and others that Uh, Concealed handguns uh, deter crime is wrong. So in one case, we have a hidden thing, a gun, that is claimed to deter crime. The other case, we have a device in the car that deters crime. And yet you you don't agree with John Lott, and John Lott doesn't agree with you. Is there any chance in these contentious areas where so many things are change, going on at once that, that I think the statistics really struggles to control for. Is there any chance that, that we can get at anything close to the truth? And even more importantly, are we really making an improvement in those situations when we use numbers or are we just uh, getting a lot of journal articles published? Yeah, so I, I think we can make progress. Uh, it's not going to this, it, These are areas that theory isn't going to uh, resolve the questions for us. One thing that one place thing that John Lott and I agree on is that uh, theory uh, just is ambiguous as to whether unobserved uh, precautions will, uh, uh, with regard concealed weapons, uh, will it's increase an, or decrease. It's an empirical crime. question because if, if one person has low jack in a, in a city, no no thief is going to worry about getting traced uh, to his to his chop shop. That's right. But if half the city has it, we're pre- you and I would be pretty confident that if that information became widely known, it would deter car theft. The, to me, the only issue there would be magnitude of the impact. Yeah, you know, whether- I mean, the big, there, is a, there is one big theoretical distinction between LoJack and concealed weapons, and that is that LoJack is never used as an offensive weapon. It's, people don't get mad and then r- take their LoJack and hit somebody on the head. So LoJack might not have any effect. But it's hard to tell a story where LoJack would increase uh, crime. That's correct. On others, whereas yeah. with concealed weapons, it's possible that you buy a concealed weapon to protect yourself, but you get drunk or mad at your spouse and go kill him or her. Right, and again, you know? that's an empirical question. And that's an empirical question, and theory just isn't going to tell you the magnitude. And so then we go to the empiricism, and you have uh, conflicting empirical studies, and. Uh, one of the things that I think John Lott really needs to be given uh, good credit for is I think he's played an important role in changing the norms of data sharing. And, uh, and indeed, part, part and parcel of this last uh, decade is now uh, leading journals are uh, starting to require empirical articles to uh, post their data publicly or give a good explanation why they are not. And that you know, that also came out of uh, – John deserves some credit for that, and so does Ed Lemer, uh, who long ago wrote an article, let's take the con out of econometrics. The pro- one of the problems with these these studies that we're talking about is that, as you point out, people run hundreds and thousands of regressions because the cost of computation is so cheap now. Yep. And what the reliability that we – the precision you talked about earlier – depends actually on how many times you change the specification, what variables you add in and out. And since often you have a bias, not you literally, but the researcher has a bias in discovering an effect, uh, we should be skeptical. But here's, let me ask the question a different way. 
In these areas I've talked about crime, uh, the effect of a controversial uh, retailer like Walmart, a controversial social issue like immigration. Do you think there is a chance that we will get closer to the truth through careful uh, clashing studies, or are we just uh, fooling ourselves? And let me give you a counterpoint. Mm -hmm. If you ask me for the gold standard in empirical work in economics, mm -hmm. I would say The Monetary History of the United States by Milton Friedman. Here is an, a, a detailed statistical analysis. It's not very sophisticated. It's just laboriously meticulous that chronicles the impact of the money supply on inflation. And it changed the way the profession looked at inflation. Before the book was written, uh, although Friedman discounts the importance of the book in an interview we did on the, in the series, but, uh, but if you look at the the before, before people said there are lots of different explanations for inflation, the book gets written, and eventually I would argue that most economists, for a variety of reasons, partly the book, partly experience, have come to believe that monetary uh, causes are the source of inflation, the changes in the money supply. Are there other issues where we've become, where we've discovered a truth like that through the careful empirical study that involves sophisticated statistical techniques? Again, where, for example, we were able to show conclusively or a consensus emerged that something was had an impact that people didn't think of intuitively or in terms of common sense. I'm, I'd like to know. I'm, I, I'm not saying there aren't any. They don't jump to mind. Well, I, so I, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's interesting that you pick out a macroeconomic. Uh, it is, isn't piece it? Of it's empirical. ironic. Yeah, the, the area. I, where I would say that it's so much harder to pull out gold. And so I would say for its time, you know, it was monumental and certainly had impact, but I wouldn't put it up in my pantheon of gold standard of, uh, as of right now. Uh, instead, I. Well, I went uh, to Chicago would, and you went to MIT. Uh, yeah, so exactly. <laughs> but I would pick out a Chicago economist, uh, James Heckman's work with. Uh, 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 on some civil rights issue that have showed the, I think, showed pretty uh, dominantly. So I'm a microeconomics person from MIT, and so yeah. I like Heckman's work showing <laughs> that uh, the 64 uh, Civil Rights Act has had, had a dramatic uh, statistical impact on the amount of hiring in the uh, in southern textile industries, uh, that there was a lot of question about whether the African-American progress preceded the um, the uh, 64 Act, and some of it did, but I think he showed pretty, uh, in work with Don John Donahue, pretty uh, uh, conclusively uh, uh, evidence that there is, uh, that there was an, an independent impact from there. And I, and I, I also think that the, uh, the, the famous uh, Donahue and Levitt uh, abortion uh, article is, uh, uh, has had a, a, a powerful impact. Now, I don't think it's the final word. It's not. I mean, a lot of people dispute that the, that finding, right? A well, lot of people not, point out problems you, in the in the in the data and, and in the analysis. I, I dis you know, I disagree. You disagree. You know, there have been uh, that, but you know, part of the the meta issue for me to go back to your early thing, I yeah. do think that the the clash of competing studies helps us make progress, and that. What you hope for is not just clash, but eventual uh, consensus. And um, in the most contentious areas, one of the good things is you draw more attention to them and that you're going to um, – and the more studies that com come in, you can start getting uh, uh, more of a sense of how, uh, how important, uh, uh, how robust the result is. And so I, I would say that we're – uh, well, we're still in the in the middle of this, but I would say that the uh, that the consensus is starting to develop that uh, no concealed weapons don't uh, laws don't have much of an impact one way or another, and indeed that uh, and indeed that the death penalty uh, relative to life imprisonment has not had much of an impact one way or. Uh, or another, but this is also. But let me say the the last word has not been spoken on this, and part of the um, uh, part of the power of these things is that they have opened up new categories of inquiry. Earlier, before you know, you asked the question: you know, Does immigration um, uh, uh, increase or decrease? You know, the welfare of uh, the GDP of the United States on that. 
uh, or I can't remember. Or wages, the, wages of native-born workers. The wages the of native issue. workers. And let me, I don't think that the answer, we have a consensus on that yet, and, uh, but you know what, we're not going to get it non-statistically. Just to have politicians come up here, I, here's my story and I'm sticking with it, I, or to tell anecdotes uh, is not going to answer this. We're going to need to do it uh, in aggregate. And there may be, at the end of the day, some of these issues, such as that very one on immigration, we may, uh, it may not be a big enough of an effect one way or another for us to, given the, uh, the difficulty of measurement, to come up with a credible uh, belief and a response. But in other things, I actually think on the abortion issue, there is now tons of, of, of alternative uh, 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 approaches that are tending to show that uh, that women that um, uh, uh, would have preferred to ha- uh, that have kids that they would have preferred to have aborted that they don't take as good care of the the kids later on and you can see this not just in the criminality of the kids but in a variety of other factors so that is a uh, but uh, I you know I welcome uh, more work and and the, the meta point is that you shouldn't just trust any super cruncher, that we should try to move more and more toward making the statistical analysis contestable. And I even think this has to be adopted more by businesses. These businesses that are starting to embrace number crunching, I don't think they're following the academic uh, clash of uh, clash of study approach. That I think it will be a good sign when businesses start hiring uh, statistical auditors or start uh, allowing uh, people to come to the same uh, questions with alternative assumptions, just like academics are doing uh, doing now. So, well, we're almost out of time. Let me let me make a different meta point, and I'll sure. let you close with a with a reaction to it. Uh, my worry is that in the examples you use, the death penalty, the concealed handguns, abortion, uh, most of the findings confirm the bias of the researcher. And that is because of the incredible uh, range of, of regressions you can run and the incredible range of techniques you can run. And many, many of the regressions that you run, that a researcher runs, don't confirm the hypothesis. So they keep crunching until they do. So on the counterpoint to your optimism, which I'd like to share, but my, I have two worries. One is the bias of the researchers, which just, to me, shouts out that uh, – People on both sides of the political spectrum tend to find results that confirm their priors, which is alarming. And my second worry is that the average citizen doesn't have the statistical sophistication to be skeptical the way you and I can be skeptical of a finding that's sloppily done. And so my meta point is I do think we need to have more data, more super crunching and more uh, education of folks to uh, be skeptical when the super crunching is done poorly. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, one one uh, test that I have for um, my uh, my friends in the academy is to say, what is the statistical study that you believe uh, but don't like? And if there aren't any <laughs> that you, if you only like, if you only believe the ones that you like, you know, you're something is you've got to be a biased consumer as well. And so, uh, but the other thing that I think this leads us Good toward question. is um, I don't think there's as much author bias in randomized studies. You, it's Agreed. easier to cook the books on regressions than it is uh, on randomized trials. And I, 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 so, uh, and I think a great example of this is look at uh, the first results out of the move to opportunity. I don't think the people that paid for that or wanted it to happen expected the results that have been coming out of it, and they're still they're incredibly powerful results just because it's, uh, you know, the, and the moved opportunity, as you know, is... No, what is that? Oh, this is a huge study where they gave vouchers to poor families, housing vouchers to poor families, so they could move to middle-class uh, neighborhoods. And so you could see, sudden, and it's a randomized experiment, so they followed both those that uh, got the vouchers and those that didn't. And you can see the impact. Does moving to a middle-class neighborhood impact something like 40 uh, life chance results? And they followed these people for 10 years. We're, I think we're six or eight years into the study now, so there have been preliminary results. And it hasn't actually improved the life very much on lots of dimensions uh, of the families that have moved. 
Has uh, or has not? Has not. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, you'd think that the bias of the people who put this money in and said, oh, we're going to establish... And change their lives better forever. Change their life better for schooling, this, you know? so better health. This, um, I agree with you. I think you got a very, very important point, but it's one of the reasons that we should more fully embrace randomization. I don't think it's as prevalent with randomized studies. Totally agree. My guest today has been Ian Ayers, the William K. Townsend Professor at Yale Law School and a professor at Yale School of Management. He's the author of Super Crunchers. Ian, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. My pleasure. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about some of the issues raised in the podcast that Ian Ayers and I covered pretty quickly. In the first part, we talked about randomized experiments and the virtues of that kind of approach. You have two large populations. One group gets the drug, one group doesn't, or one group gets the treatment, the other group doesn't. And in that case, what we rely on is the law of large numbers. We assume that when the populations are large enough, any differences between the two will wash out, they'll average out, and what we'll be observing is the effect of the treatment or the drug. But most social science research, most economics research doesn't have experimental data. We have to use statistical techniques to mimic the effect of an experiment. Suppose you want to measure whether concealed handguns reduce crime. The argument is that if more people have concealed handguns, then criminals will be hesitant to attack people. It seems reasonable. Is it true? Is the magnitude of the effect large or is it small? If one person in a city has a concealed handgun, we'd expect no effect. If half the people in the city have them, then I'd expect an effect. But how big? Ayers pointed out that concealed handguns can increase crime because someone with a permit to carry might go ballistic. True. But suppose that doesn't happen very often, and I don't think it does. The real challenge with measuring the impact of more people carrying concealed handguns is isolating the impact of the potential crime-reducing effect versus other effects going on at the same time. So, for example, concealed handguns could be correlated with more crime in that case, masking the effect of the handguns, because at the same time you pass the handgun law, something else changed that increased crime. So what you'd be observing when you measured the effect of the handguns would be a spurious correlation. Or similarly, something might happen at the same time that reduces crime, and you'd attribute that impact of the handguns to that factor mistakenly. So to isolate the effect of just the concealed handguns, you have to control for all the other factors that might affect crime. That's pretty hard. Obviously, you can't control for everything. You have to hope that you have enough good data on enough important factors that would allow you to isolate the effect of the handguns. But there's a bigger problem, what's called the simultaneity problem. Maybe people are more likely to carry guns when there's lots of crime. So you have to somehow control for causation running in the opposite direction. Otherwise, it might look like concealed handguns increase crime when it's really crime that increases concealed handguns. And all of these kind of problems make it harder to precisely measure the impact of one variable on another. Now, the same set of issues arise when uh, you look at LOJAC. Yes, it's plausible that LOJAC, and that's the radio chip that's hidden in the car, that allows the police to track a car when it's stolen. It's possible that, plausible, excuse me, that LOJAC will discourage car thieves in the same way that concealed handguns will will discourage crime. But just like the case of handguns, it's possible LOJAC won't discourage car theft. Maybe car thieves in a town with LOJAC will learn that what you have to do to avoid the bad part of LOJAC for them is just park the car on a side street after you've stolen it far away from where you stole it, watch it for a few days. If it doesn't get picked up, it means it doesn't have low jack and it's safe to drive it again. Or maybe enough people won't have low jack to really make it dangerous for car thieves in the first place. The odds are just too low you're going to get uh, caught. Then there's the same problem with controlling for other variables that might affect car theft and might lead you to conclude that low jack has a big positive or big negative effect simply because they take place at the same time contemporaneously that LOJAC is allowed to be used in a city or started to be used in numbers in a city. And there's the reverse causation problem. Maybe states allow LOJAC because there's a big problem with car theft. So it will look like LOJAC encourages car theft. 
but that's just a spurious correlation. Now, there are statistical ways to solve these problems or at least make them smaller. And of course, Ayers in his work with Levitt on Lojack and John Lott in his work on concealed handguns, but these authors, of course, try to control for these simultaneous effects. There's nothing novel about this observation that they matter and, and both sides are, very, are well aware of it and they try to solve that problem by using sophisticated statistical techniques. But those techniques are imperfect. We can never control for all the factors that cause crime. So there's always a possibility that we'll find a correlation that's really caused by an unobserved variable we couldn't measure and we falsely attribute the, ch the change to LOJAC or to concealed handguns. But what I find interesting, and you know, people argue about this, you know, oh yeah, this is this is a great bit of empirical work. They really did a great job controlling for these other variables. So they really did a great job for controlling for these simultaneous uh, reverse causation problems. But what I find interesting, and I and I really learned this from from this conversation with Ayers, is how confident Ayers is that Lojack discourages cr discourages crime and how unconvinced he is that concealed handguns have an effect. So he thinks his research was carefully done, but that John Lotz is sloppy and wrong. John Lott, on the other hand, is totally convinced that concealed handguns discourage crime, but totally unconvinced about Lojack. Lott doesn't believe the Lojack numbers because if they were true, he can't understand why insurance companies wouldn't give larger discounts for people who use Lojack. And Ayers, on the other hand, he's totally comfortable believing that insurance companies can just mess up and miss a profit opportunity. Lot's, Lot believes the simpler explanation is that Lojack doesn't deter crime as much as Ayers thinks it does. He simply mismeasured the effect. And Ayers thinks Lot has mismeasured the effect of concealed handguns. What worries me is that the source of these beliefs, maybe it isn't the quality of the empirical work, maybe it's something else. Now, for me, I believe that enough concealed handguns and enough Lojack can both discourage crime. And I suspect, but it's only a suspicion, that both researchers are right about their own work and wrong about the work of the other. But I'm highly skeptical that the work of either Lot or Ayers measures the effects with any precision. And I worry it's not just precision that's, being, uh, that's at issue here. The data may simply not be good enough to allow us to measure even the direction of the effects. My worry is that lots of meaningless results are paraded around as scientific when they are in fact not scientific at all. They just have a patina of science about them. I'm also skeptical of the ability of either side in a policy debate like this to get the other side to concede that some statistical results are more reliable than others. I don't see us moving toward a consensus, the issue that I raised in the, uh, in the conversation with Ayers. Instead, what we get is dueling regressions that don't advance our understanding. Now, most of the glamorous empirical work in economics faces these problems of multiple variables and reverse causation. The statistical technique for, for, for correcting for reverse causation is called two-stage least squares or instrumental variables. I won't try and explain that in a podcast, but my claim is that the techniques for solving these problems, as glamorous and elegant as these techniques are, they're often being used with data that are simply not up to the task. There are economists out there, for instance, who argue based on empirical work that Walmart hurts the economy when it arrives in a town. There are those who find Walmart is good for the economy. Now, you can imagine how hard it is to isolate the effect of Walmart on the wages of people living in, say, Los Angeles. But people do that. Economists go out and they try and measure whether wages go up or down in a city like Los Angeles when a Walmart opens there. Are we really advancing our understanding of Walmart when we go and do this kind of work, or are we simply dressing up our prejudices in the clothing of statistics? Let me close with an observation of Ed Lemers. I mentioned Lemer earlier in the show in his article, Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics, an article I strongly recommend. Lemer's claim is that because researchers try so many different variables and so many different specifications that fail, and they just throw those out, they, they just say, they convince themselves, that, oh, those weren't relevant. I must have done those incorrectly. I left out a key variable. So they dig around the data. They find something else until finally they find something that works, and they focus on the ones that work. Doing that gives you a very misleading measure of statistical reliability. That is, the traditional measures, measures of reliability, confidence intervals, statistical significance, say at the 95% level, that those really just go out the window totally when what we're seeing in the paper is not the researcher's 
uh, first effort, but the last effort, preceded by hundreds sometimes of regressions of different variables, different specifications that just didn't happen to work and so were rejected by the, uh, the scholar. So here's an excerpt from a recent paper of lemurs on this issue. The paper is on the role of housing in creating business cycles. It's an interesting paper in and of itself, but along the way, lemur happens to mention the pitfalls of empirical work. He starts out the section by mentioning that in medieval times, bloodletting seemed to be good for people because they often got better after the bloodletting. But we know, as the medieval folks didn't seem to, that it could just be coincidence that it's a... Uh, what the fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore because of this. And Lemur continues, quote, for valid causal conclusions, we need an experiment. We need a control group and a treated group. When all we have are non-experimental data, correlation is in the data, but causation is in the mind of the observer. With only temporal orderings and no experimental evidence, we do what empirics do. We rely on stories. To each temporal ordering, we attach a predictive narrative or a causal narrative or both. We draw firm causal conclusions from the temporal orderings when the causal narrative is compelling and when there is no equally compelling predictive narrative. This is literature and wisdom, not science. He sums it up by saying that it's, quote, faith-based decision-making, which is much influenced by the rhetorical skills of the advocates, close quote. Where does that leave the economics profession? I am increasingly skeptical of the use of sophisticated statistical techniques to tease out causal connections in complex systems. Such techniques are the rage these days. My claim is that we ought to look at them more skeptically. Too often they are faith-based empirical work. Maybe we ought to restrict our empirical work to actual experiments or to cases where the statistical techniques give less scope for the creativity and elbow grease of the researcher. Or maybe we should have empirical tournaments where all the data analysis would be conducted simultaneously by people on both sides of the ideological fence, out in the open, where all the manipulations of the data could be observed by both sides. Coming soon to the Food Channel, the Iron Economist in a cook-off against 12 other chefs, I mean scholars. Somehow I don't think this show would draw a very large audience. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>